you're building this system for, for the players. Like, how do you know, like, which, um, like, if certain drills work or certain drills don't work okay. for, for individual players? Yeah. So here's, I think, I think this is a good, like, good place to start. So I think you see people, like, arguing on Twitter and, like, you, you have all this craziness about technique and drills and all these things. And, and the, what the problem is, is, like, a lot of our preference are stylistic right? Or they're individual to us, right? Or the people we've been around. There's nothing wrong with that. But recognizing that is like the first important step. So the second thing um, is, 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 is figuring out, okay, what are the actual commonalities, right? So if let's say we're talking about just fielding a ground ball in general, or let's say we're talking about the throwing mechanics of an infielder, right? If we watched all the best guys, right? Like, so we go through and let's take every major league third baseman, right? And, and we put them on a spectrum, suddenly we'd see all these different styles show up. So if we're teaching just Matt Chapman style, or we're teaching Ev just Evan Longoria style, or if we're teaching just um, Nolan Arenado style, we might be missing out on the opportunity for that infielder to succeed in the opposite style. So you're, you have to take those guys and say, okay, the first thing is you have to find the low variable. So what do all 15 guys in the American League, or what do all 30 guys in the league do the same? All right, so they're, oh, they all, they all hinge at the hips, right? They all present their gloves out front. Or all, they, they all have subtle action. Okay, so I could say that's common. Not, Longoria proves, prefers to move his glove backwards on hops that Arenado prefers to move his glove forward. So I can't really dictate that if two, two guys who do it really well do it opposites, right? So I think part of drill design is understanding, okay, what are the low variable moves? What are the things that everyone needs to do from a 12-year-old to a major leaguer? What are the high variable moves? What are some people allowed to get away with that others aren't? What do are some people feel comfortable doing that others are? <laughs> and so then once you've categorized moves, so you recognize, hey, this guy could do this and this guy could do this and everyone can do this, then your low variable moves become like your daily vitamins. So those are the drills you feel comfortable giving to anyone without side effects, right? If you're going to get somebody in a really good position, why do Ron Washington's drills and Perry Hill's drills and Brian Butterfield's drills all look the same when they're in stationary, right? Because they recognize that the low variable is everybody gets in a good athletic posture and they use their hands out front. So that's why those drills all look the same. That's a vitamin. Right. One from posture. Now, a drill that's meant for a specific guy, that's, that's prescription medication. It might make one guy better and cause another guy to have diarrhea. <laughs> So then in those cases, you have to have studied a significant portion of film and had a ton of conversations with that player to try one of those things out, to know that, hey, the data, the video, and how the player feels all back up that this needs to change, right? And then that could be like dictating, hey, a guy like this with this body type, with how he uses his glove, he should probably be going forward on that hop. Or a guy like this with his body type, with how he positions his body, he should probably go backwards. Then you can feel comfortable and so I think the key for coaches is understanding the difference between the two types of drills. And more often than not, when I see coaches arguing in real life or on Twitter or wherever, it's about two prescription medication things. And they're, they're missing the point is that it's not for everybody. There's no one size fits all. Right. Right. And, and so I think that's how a, a program gets developed. I, and I hope that answers your question. No, I mean, that's amazing, man, because it, it's a testament to you in how much time, that you have to put into each individual player to get to know him and how much you truly care about him. Yeah. And I, I think at any level you play at from, from club ball to high school, all the way up. I mean, I think it's how much time and how much are you studying the game to really make a difference in your players. So man, that's remarkable. Um, well, I mean, th think about it this way, right? When I show up in San Francisco, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. When I show up in San Francisco, right. I can't relate to Brandon Crawford in his, the time he spent going through the minors, through the draft, his growing pains into the major leagues, the grind of the schedule, how road games affect him versus home games, how a day game after a night games affects him, all of those things, uh, how certain plane trips and hotels, affect. I can't relate to that, right? Because right. you can, Coos can, right? right? So if you know that, you have to be very aware that that's not your thing to relate to, right? So if you can't provide that relatability, you better show up in another category. And so for me, I can only learn and listen and hopefully become, that will become more relatable as time goes on. But as a young coach who didn't play, I better shut the hell up in those categories and I better dive into the parts where I can master. 
right? And so I better, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and I'm going to watch every single ball that's been hit lacrosse for, for the last five years. Because if I can't relate to the feel that he's had to, the feeling of making those plays he's had to make in those moments, then I better at least have watched them. Yeah. And I better have some context. 100%. And so, so I, I appreciate you compliment, complimenting me for that, but that's a must, you know, like that's a must out of a respect category for, oh, for the, for the lack of shared experience. Uh, you have groups of five or six. How, how do you make sure that you're getting uh, them what they need all at the same yeah. time? You can customize any drill, right? So it, let's say I'm in, I'm in either hand feeding, machine feeding or hitting with a fungo right and let's say i'm creating variability by speed speed of the runner direction or like the eventual destination right i wanted to go to second i wanted to go to first i wanted to go be fast tempo i wanted to be slow tempo i'm gonna hit it fast i'm gonna hit it slow i'm gonna range right and left as your guys cycle through the line you're only feeding one of them at a time and so without them knowing if i'm going underhand for a guy doing stationary if i'm going fungal i can skew the distribution of reps higher to one guy than the other Mm. right so like in the start of spring training i asked if i sit down with longo and i say hey longo what do you want to get out of spring more than anything else right and he'll say hey i want to create comfort on specific backhand play right like he's played long enough that he has a very specific thing i want my body to feel good enough to go through the season and i want to increase my comfort on this specific play when we go through the reps whether it's the machine or me feeding or fun going i can make sure i get him a higher volume of that Right. right. Instead of just let, leaving it up to chance. And I think that's w what we're trying to do is we're trying to be a little bit more tactical about the way we practice defense. And I think so much of it in baseball history has been up to chance. Right. You get the ground balls you get in practice. You get them in the distribution. Right. You get them depending on your time in the line. And you might happen to get five of the one you already do well. Right. Right. You no. Know? But if you got a if you got a line and you you did the research ahead of time, you can create that volume. You know, you can make yeah. the young trip away shortstop who has a hard time playing fast, you can call out fast runner every time he comes, or you can have him on a different clock than everybody else. Right. That's man. That's so good. Like you meet, in the, even in the group setting, you're, you're meeting an individual need. And what I liked about what you do is all the different variations within the drill, right? You got a guy on the knees and you're doing like the, you catch with one hand on certain ground balls and you catch with two hands on certain ground balls, but that variation well, think about it like you and, and I think Kuz is back now as well. I think I saw him back in the thing. But you guys, when you played infield play your entire life, infield play is like a series of decisions, right? Like you, all you're doing is hitting these forks in the road, right? So the very first decision, you land, which way do I go? Do I go in? Do I go back? Do I go right? Do I go left? Right? So when you play in the middle, right, as you as a utility man, you play in the middle and the corner. So when you play in the middle, you got more right left decisions than you do in and back. When you play in the corner, you got more in and back decisions than you have right left. But that's the first fork in the road. Which way do I go? Right. And then from there, the next fork in the road is like, all right, do I attack or do I create space? Right. Am I taking a flat, steeper route or a flatter route? Right. right? Then you arrive at the ball and you're like, hey, am I going to go one or two hands? Am I going to go forward or do I need to give? Right. Does it need to be shortened or does it need to be softened? Right. So then you make that decision. Then it's like, okay. Does he run or does he not run? So am I going to go quick exchange or am I going to kind of bring it up high, get to a good spot, take a second shuffle, and then throw? And so infield is a series of those forks, right? When you, where you're reacting to everything that's going around you. And so one of the reasons why I think infield defensive drills have to have variability is they have to give guys reps on those decisions just as much as they need reps on the moves themselves. That's awesome, man. Right. So I can get really good at one hand and I can get really good at two, but I got to be really good at deciding when to use one or two. Right. Man. And so that's where the variability comes in for a high level infielder is creating those decision points and recreating them without it being upping the workload too hard where you need your energy for the game, the rest right. of spring and the long season ahead. And so that's why you're seeing that variability in those, those kneeling drills. And when you're talking like that, it makes me think of what uh, Kuz we talked about a couple of weeks ago is knowing what you're going to do with the baseball before it's even hit to you. Yep. You have to pre-pitch the situation because exactly why you're talking about, Kai, like there's a lot of different forks in a road yep. that happen really quick. And if you're not ready, man, you better be saying sorry to your pitcher. That you weren't yeah. Ready. Well, think about it this way, right? So 
you bring up a great point. If I go through an average youth infield practice, high school infield practice, wherever, college infield practice, I get on my knees or I start standing, I do short hops, rolling balls. I do the hand work. I get my ground balls. Everybody throws the one. Everybody throws the one. Everybody backhand to one. Everybody turns a double play. Everybody, everybody goes long one. Everybody goes on the run, right? And then, you know, the catchers throw whatever, then we're done. The first ground ball of the game is the very, very first time the infielders had to make a choice, mm. right? And so many times when we lose our mind as coaches, right? And, and you're starting out in this thing, so you'll have this enjoyment. When you're sitting there, like, wanting to pull your hair out, it's never because a guy screws up a physical mistake, right? It's not like, oh, I can't believe he missed right. that, right? Because right. that's just missing it as part of everything. It's like, why did he go so fast there when he had time? Right. Why did he try to backhand that when he could have gone? Why did we go two there when we could have gone to one? Like, those are the things that drive you nuts. But then you think back, oh, wait, I did 30 minutes of pregame and two hours of practice, and I never gave him a choice. Hmm. You're mad at a choice, but did you ever practice the choice? That's right? unbelievable. Man. And yeah. so that's, that's what I started thinking out. I sit there on the bucket. I'm like, oh, my God, what are we doing? Slow down. It's like, so you said, like, you and Coos talked about, that 15 seconds between pitches where you're scripting right. out what you're going to do. Right. That's why I love having the scoreboard on in, in infield practice. And you can switch, switch the score and the outs and the inning right. all the time, because those affect your decisions on the infield. I might sell out and try to keep this one in, you know, I might reset my feet and let's just get one out. We got, we're up by seven. It's the seventh. If I try to force this one in, I might create a big inning. Right, taking ground balls within the context of the score, the outs, and the inning is a great way. Another great way for infielders to ramp up their decisions. Right, that's that's fantastic to have that that mindset. Um, I know I, I, like a guy that held me accountable wasn't even an infielder or a coach. Was one of my teammates, John Jay, in the outfield. He wanted to know if it was off speed or a fastball coming. I'm like, John, like. I gotta, I gotta tell the third baseman if it's an off speed. First of all, I gotta read the pitch from shortstop, like to see like they got all these numbers going down with the guy in second base. I'm like, there's a lot going on, and John Jay's like, I need to know if it's an off speed or fastball because he wants to get that jump. He's pre pitching the situation. Um, just think it's like awesome when teammates like that hold you accountable. Yep. We have a team on here from around the the, the Puget Sound area, Washington, and they want to know if you have any uh, good infield drills for like a 12 year old to do, I know there's a ton of infield drills on, on those videos on YouTube, but yeah, it's, it's classic. It's one of those, like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it things, right? Like wall, wall ball is like the gold standard for a million years for people who are at home who want to work on infield. And the key to it is like creating variation. So use a racquetball, use a tennis ball, use a baseball, do it barehanded, do it with an oven mitt, do it with your glove, do it with a batting glove. Bounce it off the top of the wall so it comes in steeper, like the hop you're talking about, Rosie, that you'd go one hand. Bounce it off the bottom of the wall so it comes in flatter, like the hops that we'd go after with two hands. Bounce it off just the base of the wall so then it climbs up and, and it forces you to turn your hands from fingers down to fingers up, right? You right. can do all those things, and I think that's the best thing for a kid to do. Uh, uh, yeah. There's no need to reinvent. Like at right. home, if you create that variation on your own, you can get every play that you get in the game. And yeah. Kai, are you, if you're doing that wall drill, are you you're constantly moving the feet and challenging yeah. yourself, right? Yep, 100%. Yeah, you can put yourself like in a bad spot on purpose, right, to make it tough. You can put yourself in a good spot. I think the options like he's talking about are, are, are really limitless. Did you do a lot of wall ball? Because, I mean, you were a foul weather infielder. I did. I did. I mean, I didn't have anybody to, you know, play with. My brother, if my little brother wasn't around. I was by myself, so. It's evergreen. Uh, evergreen. Is that where you went? Yep. All right, so just yep. basketball yeah. courting it up. That's right. Well, actually, uh, during the, you know, my senior year of high school, I didn't have one home game in evergreen. They were all down in Denver because the weather was so bad. But my dad and I, we would, we would get, uh, you know, those A-Tech, remember those yep. old A-Tech simple balls? Light flights or whatever. Yeah, we, we'd go in the uh, rec center up there and, and get a racquetball court or go in the basketball court. My dad would have a glove in one hand and a bat in the other and throw the ball up and, and hit me ground balls. And that, that's how we did it, you know? Yeah. But yeah, well, I, was, I was a big fan of the wall drill. Because foul weather, it's so tough to train yeah. all the components of your game as a position player. You can yeah, make it work. I mean, yeah. get creative. You can make it work. You can find the reps, you know, get dad, get coach. I mean, you can go in to your junior high or your high school 
gym in the morning before class or afterwards, you know, if basketball or volleyball is not in there. I mean, you, you can you can get creative and you can make it work. It just depends how good you want to be, you know. At UNC, I got in a lot of trouble because I bought that Home Depot, like, green turf for your dog to, like, crap on your patio. <laughs> and I, I'd roll it out in the wrestling room. And we just go live bullets in there because, I, I mean, you ha- we were so bad at defense for so long that it was just like we couldn't take those months off. Right. You know, you had to find, you had to find a way. Yeah. I mean, obviously I was born and raised in Chicago, so it's cold up there, there too. It's tough, to, it's tough to yeah. get. So I was throwing off the, the wall in our basement and I would put little uh, barrier, whatever you want to call them, distractions or whatever um, that were in front of me, right. That caused bad hops to happen. Right, the little uh, blockades, whatever, and, yeah. just blo- and I would have to react, make that in-flight adjustment, so stuff yeah. like that. Get creative, like Koo said. You got to be creative. Yeah, I had, I had a question for Kai. Um, well, it's actually a two a two part. I know we're talking a lot about the physical, uh, you know, practice. How much do you implement uh, the mental side of the game, right? Because I think you need it. You know, I mean, these guys, uh, Kuzmanov and Rosie, were talking about almost anticipating. You know, knowing the play, you use the scoreboard to kind of give these guys a little bit more of a, of a live look, what's going to be in the game. Um, so the first question would be, how much do you use that one-on-one on a, you know, when you're with a guy on the mental side of the game? And then the second part is, do you work more on the weakness or on the strength of the player? Okay. So I think a couple of things. So in professional baseball, and these guys can attest to this even more than I, uh, I can, how you hit is the length of the runway you have for your defensive skills, right? So some people are like afforded an extra room than others, right? So that's going to already alter like that, that second portion of in terms of like the work distribution. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. So guys who are really offensive, that, that tool can carry them further along in the game and they can arrive with more weaknesses that need to be addressed. Right. right? Where right. it, whereas like, let's say a guy shows up and all of his strengths his present strengths allow him to make the plays that he's expected to make in a major league game. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Then it's just continuing to create the reps that make him feel comfortable and his body feel good as he rolls into the game. And so you have that huge spectrum of guy in terms of strength and weakness and how you'd spend your time on a guy. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So as far as the mental game, the mental game from defense is so tough. Because in addition to having those 15 seconds in between pitches where your mind wanders and, and, and you could lose sight of what's going on in the present, you have to pre-pitch 150 times in a night to only get six balls hit to you, right? So it's like going to a golf course and getting set up at the tee box and going in your backswing and 146 times somebody comes and removes the ball off the tee and you stop your swing and only six times do they leave the ball on the tee and you got to hit a perfect drive. That's what playing defense in a game is, right? You have to have the mental stability to pre-pitch and be prepared and anticipate every single play in the hopes to get it that 10% of the time, 5% of the time. So I think constantly that's part of the pre-pitch routine. Like the collision of physical and mental on defense is an infielder's pre-pitch routine. The time they take to clear their mind from the previous play, wipe up the dirt area, look around, take a peek at the scoreboard, remind themselves of the scenario, and where, like, where the primary outs would be with the different directions. And then when they leave the earth or when they start their sink, no matter what their pre-pitch is, now I'm re-engaged just in that path and dancing with the batter. And so I think there's a huge component of mental game to be trained in defense. I think it should be centered around what happens um, during those 15 seconds. Awesome. Kuz, Rose, Kuz, Rosie, would you, you guys played a long time. Would you guys uh, agree with that? 100%. Hundred percent. I mean, my mentality was. I mean, kind of like for me personally, it was really quick. Was um, especially after a bat at bat or something. If I didn't succeed, it's tough to get back into that pre-pitch situation. You're kind of like, oh, you know, that was a nasty slider. How am I going to handle that next time? You got to get rid of that, especially for your young players to understand that it's not about me anymore. It's about that pitcher mm-hmm. on the mound. He's competing. You better have his back. And that's kind of like the mentality I always took to get over my at bat and to make sure that I was pre-pitching the situation. Yeah. You'd never seen a guy on deck, like going like this, <laughs> right? Like, well, we've seen like a million guys like in, in left field, like feeling yeah. their load. 
right? And so it, it's there's so much empty space, it's tough. Yeah. Kai, thank you so much for being on, spending the time with us. Um, I always say it, but I learned so much from uh, putting these together. Uh, it's great learning about you and from you. Um, and uh, well, this, you guys, uh, Kai, I'm not sure if you wanted to say yeah. anything else. No, no, thanks for having me. And, and just for, for the people who took advantage of this call, I think I want to highlight what Rosie and, and Kuz and these guys are doing with, in terms of giving back. You know, I think um, when you're done playing, like people can do a lot of things with their lives and they dedicated so much time to baseball already. Um, and, and we see some folks like complain about the current state of the game. We see all kinds of things, a huge spectrum of things. And for guys to say like, no, I'm going to take advantage of my experiences and my relationships to give information to young players and parents. I think that's badass. So I, I commend you guys and I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, anytime you can get the, you can get the information from the source itself, from the guys who did it at the highest level, that should be gold for kids and it should be gold for parents.